transforming in and out of the comfort of these known objects, um, unknown abstractions. Um, so it, it takes one group of objects that are very familiar, you know, um, a, a toy house or a, a, a figure of a person, and completely changes the, the perspective that the viewer will have for, by projecting these images yeah. onto the wall. Really and inanimate. rotating them at the same time. Yeah, it's like inanimate objects performing. Because of his studies, and his interest in time isn't necessarily about the progression of it, but it's about the specific moments in it. And that's where it kind of gets shut down from the effect. I think he, well, you know, essentially I think he's open to whatever happened. That's one of the, I guess one of the interesting things about him is he's not, again, like with Talatun, is he's not so heavy to where, like previous work to this, in a, in a different vein, is he's got these still shots, like from the hotel room, mm -hmm. this and the other, and then he has installations, which are like a bed in the corner of a gallery set up and left. It's a specific momentary reference, right? But it's three, you know, an installation alongside with photographs of specific moments. Mm -hmm. And so he's obstructing the kind of potential of where it goes or where it came from as far as the object goes, but allowing the viewer to imagine where it has been or where it will go. And then I think that idea, so getting the viewer to come to these ideas with these stills from his earlier work is I think where this new work is coming into mm -hmm. context where it actually is in motion. Does that make sense? And then you're yeah. making a memory which he's interested in memory and imagination. And so now you are thinking about the, the stop, the specific time in that motion, whereas, whereas, which, whereas transversely in his previous work it was kind of the opposite. Right, right. right. Yeah, there's the still object that something had happened so then the viewer puts on their own. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, their own ideas of what may have occurred in this space. Uh, wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was for their lovers, you know, what, what happened in these spaces. So with how you were talking about how Feldman was so not really heady in his conceptual development of his pieces, I think the fact that Istanbul plays such an intense contrast to what's going on in Venice right now. I mean, it's almost, I wouldn't say the complete opposite, but maybe an antithesis to the driving force in Istanbul is the politically charged activi activism of the Istanbul Biennale. The conceptual framework of the, the Istanbul Biennale. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that is the content that they're trying to strive for, is this uh, reinvestigation of how art functions for the viewer. Is it successful? Is it not successful? Is it not successful? Is it successful in the realm of the biennial? You know, these are you know, specific questions that the curators are asking. Yeah, you know, which so, is totally left out by Brown. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, what they're doing is, you know, some of the artists, having looked through the, some of the artists beyond the ones that we we're talking about, you know, I think they're even bringing in artists that question that. You know, are these artists actually creating a, a specific dialogue or a valid dialogue? So I think within the biennial that they've created, they're also creating this dialogue between artists that are included some are answering those questions specifically, and some aren't. So, you know, by asking those questions, they're also presenting those questions to the viewers so they can understand that on their own terms. For um, when, it, when it comes to activism being a very um, central um, part of the, a lot of the artwork that's on display at um, the Istanbul Biennale, um, the decolonizing.ps group, and they work with the um, an, uh, the analyzation of the remains of architecture um, from uh, 
colonies, military bases, um, set up wa um, watchtowers th that were constructed by the Israelis um, within the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. Um, and it's focused on the re-inhabitation um, and recycling of the space and how um, it, it's, you know, they, they take maps from, you know, early 1900s and compare them to colonies that have been set up or um, military bases that have been set up in the same area and notice a extreme um, contrast in how um, the architecture used to be set up. Um, now, th this plays into um, what we were talking about because they, they are they're heavily web-based. They're using video lectures, um, PDFs that you can look up in decolonizing.ps is their website. Um, they, they're focusing on destruction, the reappropriate reappropriation of land, and, and how this yeah exactly. I mean they're they're going um, so they're taking photos when you know the military bases are built, and then also what they um, after they're deserted, what the Palestinians do with them, and then how that creates a conflict between both Israelis and Palestinians because Israel will say, well, no, we built these, you can't occupy them even if we're gone. And, and how kind of absurd this, this conflict is when really th they are um, recycling this land and, and using the resources over again instead of toppling everything back over and building again. They'll, they'll change a, a watchtower, um, which, which this illustrates exactly how this is going on. Even more so, there's a, a watchtower and from the military base um, that the Israelis built um, once it was deserted, the uh, Palestinians came in, and instead of having the watchtower to um, kind of voyeuristically, you know, survey um, what was going on, um, what the Palestinians were doing, they they went ahead and turned it into a cinema, so the city could actually look up at this watchtower, which is strategically placed at the top of this this hill, um, at the highest point in the area for military purposes or whatever. And, and completely transformed what was originally um, used for military purposes for, for more of a, a, a public outlet. Um, so instead of Israelis watching Palestinians, it was Palestinians watching cinema on this and it became more of a public function. And doc decolonizing.ps is archiving and documenting these um, conflicts or um, occurrences as they does decolonizing PS, like the people that work in it, do they participate in the recycling of these buildings or are they only documenting it? Uh, from my understanding, they're, they're mainly documenting it and using, um, using the internet to uh, get a larger base of people to see what's going on there. So they're using photographs and, and video lectures to um, expand an understanding of what is occurring in the area. Yeah, they, they set up interviews so that they're creating you know this political dialogue in their you know, their web page and uh, their interviews and everything, and then they're opening up for you know it's it's free information. You know that you don't have to go to a gallery to see this. You you simply can get on the web and view what's happening, engage in it in your own way, um, make your own decisions. So I don't think it's a pretty savvy way to work. Which is a huge contrast from picking an artist that is